Okay, this is Fizz2320 Computing 2, and this is the second video on the SymPy series. Uh, on this video, I'm going to be talking about calculus and differential equations. So, in the first SymPy video, I introduced you to doing symbolic maths in Python via the SymPy module, um, and we were using it to write expressions, to simplify, factorize, and expand expressions, to find roots to solve simultaneous equations, and then we used it to do a simple physics problem from the uh, first year tutorial booklet. Uh, so this video, we're gonna cover um, another couple of important parts of SymPy. We're gonna do um, calculus, so differentiating and integrating, and we're also gonna do solving differential equations, or at least introduce them. Okay, so let's jump over to our spider. So as before, you can either do, if you're on the cluster machines, you can either do from SymPy import init session and then run init session, um, or else you can uh, type the commands in manually. Um, if you're using bleeding edge SymPy, then you have to type the commands in manually or have a little script that does it for you. So let's just start by creating our a simple quadratic expression. We'll just use the same one we were using um, in the first video, there we go. And the first thing we're gonna do is, well, let's just plot out that expression so we can see what it looks like. So there we go. Um, it's a quadratic and we can see it's a turning point somewhere between 2.5 and uh, five, or somewhere between three and five. In fact, this turning point's gonna be four. Um, and let's just go and prove that's the case. Okay, so, the way we're going to do that is we need to go and differentiate it. So we're going to differentiate with respect to x. So I just do expr dot diff double f x, and that produces a differential. You see 2x minus 8, so clearly you can just see straight from doing it that that's going to have a solution for x equals 4. Um, but we can prove that's the case just by using our friend solve again and yes indeed x equals 4. Um, we can also do the double differential so that's simply just done by doing x comma 2 which means differentiate x twice with respect to x twice over and comes up with the answer 2. Again if you look at the original um, expression it's fairly obvious that anything which is x squared if you differentiate it twice is going to end up with an answer of two okay so that's not particularly exciting um, we can also um, uh, differentiate things if we have functions which have a function of more than one variable so let's create a thing called z which we'll say is sine x times cos y so z dot diff x, just differentiating with respect to x, and z dot diff y is just differentiating it with respect to y, and diff x comma y is differentiating it with respect to x and then with respect to y. Um, so what it's doing there is it's calculating partial differentials of z with respect to x and then the partial differential of um, uh, x of z with respect to y and then it can go off and actually go and do that okay um, we can also integrate things so if we go back to our quadratic expression um, I can integrate by just doing the expression dot integrate I can integrate with respect to x and it goes off and does it um, notice it's not actually included the integration constant there so it's sort of implicitly done that from 0 to x um, in the limits, which means you don't get an integration constant cropping up. Um, we'll show you in a uh, few minutes how you can get an integration constant. Do, do this um, as though it had an integration constant in it. OK, so uh, that's all nice. Um, we can also integ integrate over specific limits. So the way I do that is rather than with respect to x, I put in a tuple which is x and then the upper and lower limits. Uh, in fact, let's do this with numbers first. So from 0 to 4. 
OK, and then close brackets for the closing of the integrate. So you see here, rather than just applying a simple x as the argument to this uh, integrate method, I've provided a tuple which has three elements, x, the variable I'm integrating with respect to, the lower limit and the upper limit. It goes off and does that, and it returns 52 over 3. Um, if you want to go and check what that actually is as a floating point number, you can just stick an eval f on the end of it, like that, with open close brackets, and that forces it to turn it into a floating point number, so 17.333 and so on. Um, so simply because it's doing math symbolically, we'll attempt to go and keep things as rational fractions if it possibly can. Okay, uh, we can also do the same integral, um, but rather than between specific numbers, we could do it between A and B. And then it just goes and does that sum and sticks in the numbers. Of course, it's um, not so meaningful without evaluating what A and B actually limits are, but you can see it's gone and done the integral correctly. Um, now, it's an important point here to show you what would happen if we didn't have that in a a tuple of three elements. What would happen if I just integrate with respect to x comma a comma b? Well this is what you get. So that's clearly slightly different. So what it's done here is, is assume that what I wanted to do was integrate this expression with respect to x and then integrate it with respect to some new variable a and then integrate it again with some new variable b. Um, and if you do that then it's going to integrate with respect to x. So you get the first term in, in brackets there, and then if you integrate that with respect to a, it simply becomes a times that, and then if you integrate all of that with respect to b, it simply becomes a b times the um, bit that's all in x's. So what's going on there is it's trying to, if you give it multiple arguments to integrate, it'll integrate as though it's doing a double or a triple integral. So of course that can be useful, so we can do z dot integrate x comma y, which would integrate z over the range x uh, and y. So it's doing a double integral and it goes off and does it. Um, and we can even do that with limits by giving it so x0 pi by 2, a tuple of three elements again for the first argument, and then a tuple of three elements again for the second argument. And there we go and it goes off and does it, and it tells you the answer is 1. Okay, so let's go and apply this now to a kind of real physics problem. And what we're going to do is going to have a look at a thing called the Leonard Jones 612 potential. So this is something you met in semester 2 last year in the solid state part of the course. So this is a, um, a function that describes the potential energy in a van der Waals bond. Um, so before we start we're going to need a few more symbols. So we're going to need a an eta, we're going to need a sigma, and we're going to need an r. Eta, sigma, r, and these are all real numbers, and they're all positive as well. So there we go, and then I'm going to write down the Leonard Jones potential. So that is. 4 times eta times and then sigma over r to the 12th power minus sigma over r to the 6th power and that should do the trick. Just check that looks right. Lj Okay, yep, that seems to be the Leonard Jones 612 potential. So let's just go and uh, plot that out so we can check it looks right. Um, so I'm going to have to substitute in um, some numbers for uh, eta and sigma. So I'll just make them equal to 1 for the moment just while we plot. And we're going to plot a range from r to 0 0.9 to 4. Uh, I happen to know that's a range that looks okay. And let's run that plot. And there we go. So this is what the function looks like. Um, and as you might expect, it has a minimum. That's the lowest energy, lowest potential energy in the system. So that's where the bond forms. 
um, then as we get too close to the atoms too close to each other the potential energy goes shooting up and if we pull them away from each other it goes asymptotically towards zero. Okay so that's that looks right. So the first thing we want to do is say let's go and find the equilibrium bond length. So that's going to be the turning point on this function. So in other words what we're going to have to do is differentiate and set it equal to zero. Okay so that's easy enough to do. We just do lj dot diff with respect to r. So that gives us an expression that um, is a differential of the Leonard Jones potential with respect to r, and then we simply have to solve for that. And there we go. And it comes up and it tells me there is a solution for r being the sixth root of 2 to the power sigma. So if I actually tell it explicitly to go and solve it for r, then it just gives me the answer. Um, notice the square brackets around that, that means it's technically a list. So we want the first element of that. Okay, and there we go. And I can just set that equal to a variable. Let's call that req for r equilibrium. Okay, so now what we could do is we could find an expression for that bond energy. So that just means we need to substitute back into our um, the Jones 612 potential the equilibrium value of R for R, like so. And it comes up and it tells us that the bond energy is minus eta. And if you remember that tutorial problem, then um, you remember that was indeed the correct answer. Um, what about if we substitute that equilibrium R into the differential with respect to R? Okay, well you should be able to work out what this will do. Indeed it gives us zero, because that's how we found that equilibrium value of R. So of course the um, differential of the Leonard Jones 612 potential is indeed the force in the bond. So we can in fact show that on the graph. Let's plot um, Lj subs eta1 sigma1 again um, and then the differential with respect to r subs eta1 sigma1 and over a range 0 0.95 to 4. Um, so the only other thing I'm going to do is rather than just plotting the differential I'm going to plot minus the differential and I'm also going to divide it down by about 20 or so just to um, help the scaling on the plot look nice. Um, oops, missed out a bracket. There we go. Okay so this curve here, the lower one this is the Leonard Jones 612 potential, and then this curve here is the um, differential of it, well, minus the differential of it, um, and you can see indeed it crosses through zero at the minimum. So this is the, the differential of the potential energy is the force, so this is the force in the bond, and you see it goes through force equals zero at the equilibrium bond length, which is what you'd expect, um, and it's strongly repulsive you're away from that and it's attractive to some extent if you're a little bit further apart. So in other words it pulls the bond in and holds it about that position. Okay so the other thing we can go and do is we could look at the second differential of the Leonard Jones potential because that is the spring constant. So the differential of the force with respect to the distance is going to be um, some which gives you the spring, the spring constant, and there we have an expression for it. And again, we can substitute in R for the equilibrium R. There we go. 
and it tells us what the bond constant, the, the spring constant of the, of the bond is. Okay, another thing we can go and do is we can say, well, what actually happens um, if we, uh, instead of just looking at the potential, we think about expanding it as a power series. So we can do that easily enough. We just use series, and then we're going to tell it that we want to um, expand about, expand in terms of R, we're going to expand about zero, and we want, um, say, five or six powers, like so. Okay. Um, and, sorry, I've messed that up again. I should have put that inside. getting it to want to go and expand that about, oh, expanding about zero, that's my problem. I don't want to expand about zero. So, classic ones, um, you have to think of your physics. So I want to expand it about the equilibrium position. I don't want to expand it about zero, because expanding about zero is going back and telling me it's going as something horrible to the um, 12th and 6th power. Um, if I ask it to expand about the equilibrium bond position, you can see it gives something which looks really quite messy. Um, it's worth just having a quick look in here. Um, so look at the, the powers we've got here. We've got R minus the equilibrium position to the fifth power. We've got R minus the equilibrium position to the fourth power. We've got R minus the equilibrium to the third power. And we've got R minus the equilibrium to the second power. And then we've got eta, and then it's coming up and saying, and we've got a whole bunch of other terms which are of order that to the sixth power. Um, what we don't have is anything which is going to the um, first power, so there's nothing that's looking like it's at all linear in that expansion. It's a bit easier if instead of trying to expand it in terms of R about the equilibrium bond position, if we rewrite our Leonard Jones 612 potential in terms of a new variable, um, which is going to be, which I'm going to call x. I'm going to say x is equal to r minus the equilibrium bond position. So x becomes a kind of like an extension on the bond. Um, so the way I actually write this is say substitute r for x plus my equilibrium bond position. Okay, so that makes the Leonard Gen 612 potential look a bit horrible and messy. But now, and I ask it to do a series expansion in terms of x, x0 equals 0 in this time because um, uh, x is already taking into account the equilibrium bond position. So we want to extend, expand it about x equals 0. And again, we'll do six terms to start with. How uh, about six terms to start with? And whoops, n equals 6. There we go. And it goes away and thinks about it. And here it's come back again. And now you can see it's rewritten that series expansion. So this is the same expansion we just had previously, but now it's rewritten in terms of this variable x, which is the bond extension. So you can see we have a term in x to the 5, x to the 4, x cubed, and x squared, and a constant, but we don't have any linear term. So what's that telling us? Well, it comes back to. Um, plotting the Leonard Jones 612 potential. What it's telling us is that, it, to a good approximation, the potential well in this area is well described by a quadratic with some higher order terms. Um, and if one actually evaluated these higher order terms for um, realistic values of eta and sigma, then um, what you discover is that these higher order terms are rapidly disappearing off to zero for small values of x. So in other words, for small values of x, this thing really does look very much like 
um, eta min uh, sorry x squared minus eta, where eta is the the bond energy. So in other words, what it's telling you is that this Lenergy N612 potential looks quite like a simple harmonic oscillator. Um, because remember, a simple harmonic oscillator, the potential energy goes as x squared. And that's what this is telling us. So we're able to get a little bit of physical insight by examining this Lenergy N612 potential using SymPy to do all of the hard number crunching for us. Okay, so that's um, a good example of doing some things with um, simple calculus. So let's move on to some differential equations. So we can use this um, dot diff format to go and set up some very simple differential equations. So let's go and write, I'm going to call this differential equation, I'm going to call it DEQ, and I'm going to use the EQ function again that we introduced last time. So that takes left hand side, comma right hand side, and that's because you can't just write um, y equals mx plus c because all you do is create a variable y and set that equal to the expression mx plus c rather than actually writing something which is a mathematical equation which SymPy can manipulate. So in this case we're going to have y, I'm going to say y is a function of x, so I just do y brackets x and then diff with respect to x. So strictly speaking what I've just written there is dy dx. And I'm going to say that is equal to um, m times x plus c. Should we do that? No, let's just do, make it even simpler than that. Let's just do make it equal to x. Okay, deq. So there we are. d by dx of y of x is equal to x. Okay, now this is not a difficult differential equation to solve. Um, but we're going to solve it anyway. So the way to solve a differential equation is you use dsolve. And what I do is I tell it the equation, deq, and then I tell it what function I'm trying to solve for. In this case, it's y of x. I put it in, and I say go do it. And it comes back and it says y of x is equal to c1 plus x squared over 2. OK, again, you can probably do that. Um, integration in your head but you see now what it's put in is it put in the integration constants so d solve when it's solving the differential equation does put in all the integration constants you'd need okay so for example we could set up deq equals an equation y of x diff x comma 2 comma the expression we had before. So DEQ now says second differential of um, y is x squared minus 8x plus 15. Solve my differential equation um, and I want y of x coming out of it. And there it goes off and does it. And now because that was a second differential, second order differential equation, we have some extra constants floating around. So we have C1 and C2. But again, you can see fairly trivially it's gone and done the right integration there. Okay, so let's go and pick a uh, real physics example. Let's go and try and solve something like a simple harmonic oscillator. So um, the sort of standard pendulum equation. Okay, so let's go and create a few more symbols. So for this, I'm going to want L and G symbols, L and G. And I'm going to want to make sure that these things are real numbers and most importantly, that they're positive numbers. Okay, so now my differential equation is going to be on the one side x of t differentiated with respect to t twice so dx squared squared dt so d2x dt squared and that should be equal to minus g over l times x of t 
Okay, so um, that's just simply the uh, a simple harmonic oscillator. Um, that's what you get if you are working the small angle approximation for a standard pendulum. Um, okay, so we can finish our definition of equation. So DEQ there you can see that's what we've got. This is indeed what we hope it should be. So that we can do DEQ and then I can say whoops X of T. And it comes away and it comes back and says the solution is um, sine root G over L T plus um, C2 cos G over G over LT, uh, sorry, root G uh, L over LT. Um, it's not written in the most friendly way, but you can see that is what it's actually doing. Um, of course, the reason you've got a sine and the cosine there and two constants is because you'd now need to go and apply some boundary conditions um, and stick in, say, an initial value and an initial velocity. Um, this is where there's one slight um, gotcha in SymPy, and that is that the uh, provision of boundary conditions in solving differential equations isn't fully implemented. So in fact you have to then go and do it yourself. So having um, found that um, equation you then have to go and um, differentiate it to find the velocity equation and then you'd have to solve it um, for um, as two equations putting in the right numbers. Um, so we should be able to go and do that um, uh, in principle. Um, so what we do is we'd get the, um, uh, let's go and just get that solution um, into a variable. So sol right hand side, that's the expression for x of t. And if I substitute in T of zero, then you see that T of zero is just C2. And if I take that right hand side and I differentiate it with respect to T, then that's the what you get um, for the velocity. And again, if I substitute in initial time zero, then it says the next thing I should get is the C1 G over L. Um, so now um, if I put in known values of um, G and L and initial displacement and initial velocity, I could go and solve um, for C1 and C2. Uh, um, and that would then go and let me write out the full equation. So it's a little bit more work, but you can just go and um, solve your boundary conditions like that. Of course, that's quite a simple, straightforward differential equation to go and do. We can modify our differential equation to uh, add other things. So one thing we might go and do, for example, is try and add some uh, damping into that. Um, so before we go and do that, I'm just going to add the uh, math in. Oops, yep, symbols M. Real, true. Okay. So now I'm going to rewrite this. So to add a damping term in, all I'm going to do is on this side of the equation, on the right hand side of my differential equation, I'm going to add plus eta over m times x of t diff t. So this is my new differential equation and now what I've introduced in here is a damping term um, which yep I think that has everything I need in it. Yes, x t over l and everything. Yes, okay, that's all correct. So now we're going to say desolve that differential equation for x of t. And 
and we'll go away and do it. And now what you see is it's giving us um, the sum of two exponentials, but we need to stick in all the constants in order to actually work out um, what that looked like. And that's what you're expecting because if you remember back to your uh, waves and oscillation course last year, if it's an overdamped function, overdamped oscillator, then it'll just decay with an exponential. And if it's underdamped, it'll oscillate. And if it's critically damped, then um, it will go and do just one oscillation and come back to go go to zero. Okay, so um, that has actually now come up with the correct equation. Um, there's only one slight problem, and that is this is not a particularly realistic form of damping. Um, what's actually more realistic is in fact not to have that as um, just going with the velocity, but it tends to go with the velocity squared. So I can put that in like that. Say, so, okay, give me a nice printout of DEQ. Um, and there we've got it. You've got the velocity squared in there. And now if I try and do a solution to that, it comes up and says it can't do it. So again, SimPy can only do so much for you. Um, and in particular, it's not necessarily going to be able to solve every single arbitrary differential equation you throw at it. So what you do in these situations is you need to go to do it numerically. And if you look at the fifth video in SciPy series, then I've shown you how to go and solve this sort of problem uh, numerically. Again, it's a little bit more work, but it can be done. Um, and it can be a useful thing to know that you can do it and how you might go about doing it. OK, so in summary, um, we've done calculus, so differentiation and integration. Um, and then I've used that with the Zener Jones 612 potential. And I've shown you how to create a series um, and to go and expand the series about um, a particular point. And then we've also had a quick look at differential equations. So um, creating a differential equation, so I've been doing that with the EQ function and um, the syntax is y brackets x, close brackets dot diff, x or x comma 2 or whatever you need to do. And then this right hand side of that equation should be some function which involves x and y. And then you simply do desolve deq and tell it that it's um, the uh, y of x that you're trying to solve for if it's not obvious from the differential equation. Okay, and that's us for today.